everyone's like wide awake. Not too many beers last night. It's uh, uh, yeah, I, I only had two actually, so I, I, was, uh, I was pretty good really. Okay, uh, first speaker this morning is Professor Manu Platt. He received his bachelor's degree in biology from Morehouse College and a PhD in biomedical engineering from Georgia Tech and Emory University, where he's currently an associate professor. His research interests include tissue remodeling, HIV, cardiovascular disease, sickle cell disease, and strokes. Today, Professor Platt will be presenting his work, uh, pre presenting the work, Quantitative Dissection of Proteolytic Networks Governing Tissue Remodeling. Professor Platt. Oh, yeah. You get the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for the introduction. Very formal. I didn't know he could be this formal. Um, and thank you all for having me. Seriously, I'd like to thank Andre for the invitation. Um, I'm not a medicinal chemist. I have learned a lot being here, and I love some of the tools you all make and develop, so we'll be in touch. And hopefully I can show you some ways that I think about inhibiting cathepsins in their physiological and pathophysiological contexts. Um, so again, I bring you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I do a lot of different things, and so let's go. So where is Atlanta? For those that know, it's a short walk from Sao Carlos <laughs> with a little bit of a swim in the middle. Um, but we're down here in the southeast part of the United States in the state of Georgia. Um, but it is a fantastic, vibrant city. As I've been telling people, they hosted the Olympics in 96 and afterwards the city has just exploded. And I moved down there in 1997. Um, but for those that don't know, the Centers for Disease Control or the CDC is in Atlanta, Georgia, right next to Emory University. Um, Coca-Cola headquarters are there, so I love Pepsi, but I have to smuggle in Coca-Cola to work because Coca-Cola headquarters is right by Georgia Tech. So, um, you know, you don't want to get caught on campus. Um, we also have the world's largest aquarium. Um, and of course, it's a home for the civil rights movement in the United States. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was from Atlanta and um, his center is there and he's buried there as well. Um, and I wanted to show this picture of the Georgia Aquarium. If you come to Atlanta, even just to transfer at the airport, give it like a five hour transfer so you can come to our aquarium. We have, I think, th anywhere between three and five whale sharks, which is the largest fish, but they keep dying. So that's why they keep, I say three to five. I don't know what's going on, but it's a beautiful serene room where you can really just think it's amazing. Then my department, I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and we are a joint department between Georgia Institute of Technology, where all the engineering happens, and Emory University School of Medicine. So a public school partnered with a private school. It was this kind of innovative thing that got started. Um, and we have several different research areas. Most of the faculty cross in multiple of these areas, as you'll see from my work and from all the different things that I study. Um, and I, we have a campus on Georgia Tech, and then this is our campus over on Emory University, where we have faculty on both campuses. So those that want PhDs, think about it. And I'm in charge of admissions for the department, so let me know if you're interested. Also, I want to say happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> the reason I was allowed to be here and stay so long, this is a holiday week in the U.S. Tomorrow is Turkey Day. So I will be missing all of this food with my family, except my family doesn't cook all these like fancier versions of whatever this is. But, um, you know, we don't post our pictures on the web. Okay, so who am I? So I run the Platt Lab for repair, regeneration, and remodeling. And as Peter mentioned, a big focus in my group is sickle cell disease and why children with sickle cell disease get strokes. And this builds off of my background of cardiovascular disease and hemodynamics. Um, so that also led me to do a lot of work with HIV and cardiovascular disease, which is why I was interested in the presentation from yesterday. I'm a part of a center that's called EBIX, where we are actually trying to build these biological machines and take different groups of cells to work with each other on engineered platforms. But today I'll be talking a lot about our systems biology work and predictive medicine. We think about this really in terms of breast cancer, but also cardiovascular disease as well. Um, so there's my website. Check us out. We do fun things. So when I say tissue remodeling, what does that mean, right? And so I think about it as how do you go from this healthy tissue to this diseased tissue? So this is a human coronary artery that would supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. And when you get atherosclerosis and these plaques form, some of the initial stages that cause this plaque to form are actually tissue degradation. Because I have to hold the mic, you're gonna see how nervous it is. I can't stabilize, sorry is some initial degradation of some of the protein structures in the artery wall that then cause the cells to receive different cues, migrate, and exacerbate this plaque to form. So we care about how does that tissue go from this open lumen where the blood can flow to this block lumen. 
A lot of people know about osteoporosis, particularly Micah Thepson K, wonderful people in the audience, where you go from this normal bone matrix that's collagenous and mineralized to then you get the degradation of type 1 collagen, loss of the mineral, and the bone loses its mechanical properties and susceptible to breaking. I show this, this is one of the biological bots we built in EBICS where it's skeletal muscle that built on these PDMS, quote, feet that you can put electrical impulses and it will walk. But over time, it breaks in the middle. And so if we want to design functional times for these biological machines, our role in the project is understanding why this thing started to break over some length of time and how we could modulate that for the appropriate length of time you wanted it to be functional. But I love Cathepsins, uh, first and foremost, and that is at the root to everything that we do in my group. Started working with them when I was a PhD student in atherosclerosis. But as, and again, I think about them in a number of disease contexts, as mentioned in my introduction. Um, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, tendon damage, and of course, tumor metastasis. But what I find really wonderful about them and, and, and challenging for them to be so understudied is that they are the most powerful mammalian collagenases and elastases. So they degrade elastin and collagen better than any other enzyme in our bodies. And they're difficult to, uh, to study for all of the reasons people in this room know, which I think is why they have been overlooked broader in broader spaces. Um, again, they function best in an acidic pH, um, which makes them challenging. When I was first in graduate school, I was, this is a couple years ago now, a long time ago, that um, outside of the cell, everything was a neutral pH, so they shouldn't work. Now, we know that is not true anymore, but that's another reason they were overlooked. Of course, they prefer a reducing environment because of that active site cysteine. And then they're highly regulated such that they should not work as well when they do escape the lysosome, synthesizes inactive precursors, and it must be proteolytically cleaved to be active. But really a driving force is they are involved in so many what I call these tissue destructive diseases that pharmaceutical companies have really been trying to target them for inhibition, but they keep failing in human clinical trials, which is billions of dollars lost, right? So 16 cathepsin inhibitors have made it through to human clinical trials. As you all are aware, the last one, odonicotib, just was pulled after phase three. But crazy enough, it was fast-tracked through phase one and phase two and phase three because it was highly efficacious against osteoporosis. But then in a final panel, side effects took it out because there were cardiovascular complications. We could talk about that over the break, like how serious that should have been, but you know, I, I'm not Merck. But I, so we wonder in my group about what are these reasons that the side effects happen because if the drugs are efficacious, what are we not understanding that's causing these side effects or off-target effects that are stopping these inhibitors from being used? Because the medicinal chemists, you all are doing great jobs with warheads and all the rest, but I think there's misunderstanding about how the proteases themselves are being regulated. And so this is a great review paper from Chris Overall's group at um, Vancouver, where there's a number of other ways that proteases are regulated. And so studying enzymes, I like to tell my friends and colleagues that we are um, post-central dogma. So, you know, the central dogma is DNA to RNA to protein, but our proteins have to be active to do something, right? So there's this whole other world of things that we have to consider, not just, oh, the gene is up, oh, the protein's made. There's all this other regulation we, we have to consider. So some of, I'll present over the course of this few minutes um, some of our three main hypotheses about why we think some of these inhibitors have had trouble being translated to clinic. And these are my hypotheses. We test hypotheses. They don't always have to be correct. And hopefully that will define the three different approaches that we'll be taking. Um, and so I'll start with dif um, the difficulty in quantifying amounts of active protease for appropriate dosing. So as you all know, the cathepsins are synthesized as procathepsin zymogen form that must then be cleaved to be activated. So you get procathepsin K, has a pro piece, cleave it either under low pH where it will autolytically cleave itself or other proteases can come and activate it. And then you get a 29 kilodalton protein, right? And that's the mature enzyme. When it's in its native conformation, it can bind substrate at the active site, cleave it and things can work. But when the proform does not bind substrate or if the enzyme becomes denatured or degraded, it won't bind substrate. And as mentioned, they will denature under a neutral to basic pH over some time frame. Okay. But so the issue here too is that the procathepsin is very stable at neutral pH. So when people started looking for it in plasma, in tissue, they would find the proform because the antibodies they were using would bind to the proform and the mature form. So the proform dominates what they would detect and they would say, oh, we see it. But the mature active form is the one that needs to be dosed and targeted if you're going to bind that active site, right? 
but this is very unstable and doesn't stay around for a long time. So when I started um, my own group, first thing we wanted to do is I wanted my lab students to have easier tests that they can quantify cathepsin, active cathepsins. When I was a PhD student, we had the synthetic substrates. The substrates are promiscuous. Cathepsin B and K can degrade them. L degrades everything K can degrade. And it just became a mess where you'd have to use multiple inhibitors. The inhibitors cross-react. Multiple substrates, they cross-react. And you had to do like four different tests to show your enzyme was the one responsible. It's a lot of work, a lot of money. And so we developed multiplex cathepsin zymography. So MMPs, one of the other protease uh, members, um, MMP zymography had been developed for years. Um, and so we wanted to use this for cathepsins. And I had modified it when I was a PhD student, but I really wanted to make it a robust technique. So again, I know there's not a lot of wet lab experimentalists, but people have heard of SDS page or electrophoresis, right? OK, so it's based on electrophoresis, where we would make a polyacrylamide gel except we would embed it with gelatin, which gelatin is a simplified form of collagen that lots of proteases can degrade, okay? So the gelatin is cross-linked within our polyacrylamide gel. Then we could take cells or lyse our cells or use recombinant enzyme or purified enzyme, and we put it into a loading buffer, just like if we were loading for SDS page, or we are, but this is non-reducing SDS page, so there's no beta mercaptoethanol. We are not breaking disulfide bonds, okay? And that'll be important momentarily. And so then we could load it into our um, polyacrylamide gel, apply an electric voltage, and the proteins will separate by their molecular size. So the smaller proteins can navigate this torturous matrix a lot faster than the larger proteins, so you get this separation. Now I say by their molecular size because we have not broken disulfide bonds, so they're not fully linearized proteins as you normally do for SDS page or reducing. Then instead of transferring it to a membrane as you would for a Western blot, we actually take the entire gel, transfer it to this renaturing buffer. And with the renaturing buffer, we actually wash out the SDS and refold the enzymes inside of the gel at the site where they were separated by the electrophoresis, okay? And then from there, we transfer it to an assay buffer, which has all of the reagents and chemicals that are optimal for cathepsin activity, so it's an acidic pH. And we incubate this overnight where the cathepsins will degrade the gelatin in the polyacrylamide gel at the site where they were separated by the electrophoresis, such that the next morning we can stain the entire gel with Kumasi blue, which stains all proteins dark blue. So you get the kind of a negative where you get a dark blue background, but these cleared white bands where the proteases have degraded the gelatin inside of the gel. And so we've, here's a nice actual image of one, and then you can quantify the white bands with densitometry to give an amount, an indicator of how many active proteases were present. And so we like this, and we've actually been able to multiplex this for cathepsins K, L, S, V. So you hear me talk about those a lot. And such that they even migrate to different distances inside of the, electro or the polyacrylamide gel. So you can quantify them separately all in one preparation. Why I love this, great for not a number of reasons. Number one, it only gets the active enzyme. So not the procathepsin form that people can detect by all these other ways. Um, but then also there's no antibodies, so it's cheap, <laughs> which should be really good for faculty members, very cheap. Um, and so what are the differences? So we found that cathepsin K zymography is actually much more sensitive than immunoblot or Western blot. Um, you can see with the Western blot, with this, this antibody is no longer available, it really hurts my heart. Um, but you can see the antibody detects the proform, 37 kilodaltons. We can activate it to the mature K, and you see the lower 25 kilodalton band. Western blots are good for amount, and also you can tell the type there. The zymography is good because it tells us the active protease, because it must be active to cleave the gelatin inside of that gel, okay? And so what was interesting when we were first developing this assay, this was really confusing because the proform should not have signal, right? Um, so we were like, but well, why do we keep seeing proform in our preparation? Um, turns out that um, the zymography is actually more sensitive, oh, thank you, more sensitive than the Western blot. How do we know? Um, we actually then looked at the limits of detection of the Western blot compared to the zymogram. And you can see the Western blot with that really good antibody peters out around one nanogram but we can get down to three or what, 0.1 nanograms and below, which is about femtomole amounts of mature cathepsin K being active. So this is quite exciting. And again, as I mentioned, we've multiplexed it. So we can now do KLSV altogether. And this assay, because it doesn't require antibodies, has been quite cheap and allowed us to take it to some interesting parts of the world. So, but to first show practicality of it, we wanted it to, it's been demonstrated in a number of different ways that mRNA for cathepsin K is up in breast cancer. They can look at immunohistochemistry. We wanted to show that the mature active enzyme 
was elevated in human breast cancer. So we acquired human breast cancer. These are patient-matched samples, so normal sample and tumor sample from the same woman. Um, and we then loaded them for zymography, and we have a, a, a dose curve of active cathepsin K so we can do absolute quantification. And you can see here, I love this image, because in biology, things are rarely binary, right? You just don't see that everything's like on a scale. But if you look at this, normal tumor, normal tumor, normal tumor, normal tumor, normal tumor. There's like no cathepsin K in the normal mammary tissue, such that you could even like draw a flat line here, my hand is shaking, to distinguish between normal and tumor samples with a wide range of sensitivity and of 100% sensitivity and specificity. So we published this not only for breast cancer, but for lung and cervical cancer, and also across different stages of the cancer, which gave some really interesting dynamics, which we can talk about later. Um, but my student, Ben Ben, was the first author on that. He was fantastic. And, and then we use uh, zymography to even look at different breast cancer cell lines. And again, nothing is the same, right? So for each of these different breast cancer cell lines, we loaded equal amounts of the protein lysate, and you see different amounts of protease activity for cathepsins K, V, S, and L, which means if we're gonna target them with inhibitors, depending on the tumor phenotype, there actually may need different types that need to be targeted to um, prevent that cancer from metastasizing. But so we use this technique again in lots of different diseases. So sickle cell disease, tendinopathy, endometriosis, many of these diseases that I call tissue destructive diseases that they will upregulate enzymes to degrade matrix that either causes damage or to help the disease progress. And also because there's no antibodies, we've been able to take this to uh, low resource countries. So this is us in South Africa doing the HIV work. I am nervous that blood does have HIV in it. And um, woo, okay, fine, we're still good. Okay. <laughs> Um, and this is also taking us to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, first for the HIV work, but then it turned out the professor we were working with, this is actually the emergency room there, and this is one of my former graduate students, and we kind of supplied this whole lab with the reagents. But um, we were there for the HIV, and then the doctor we were collaborating with told us about young women in Ethiopia presenting with aggressive forms of breast cancer. And so we then, now we've been over there working with aggressive breast cancer, and women in their 20s were showing up with breast cancer, right? It's terrible. Um, and because there's no antibodies, it's a really cheap assay. We just bring the electrophoresis equipment. You get the salts that you buy at your chemical reagent store. And so we've been training the graduate students there um, how to run these tests because they have these amazing tissue banks um, that they keep stored. And these are two of my grad students that came with me. They both graduated now also. So quantifications. We have improved ways of quantifying the active enzyme, but now it comes down to this proteolytic network regulation and then this interactions among the proteases. So again, I'm an engineer by training, secondary training, I guess. And so to stay in my department, I have to do some math or some engineering -y things. Um, and so computational models were something that I really started to learn about during my graduate coursework that I really became fascinated with. At first, I was resistant of how will you use math to talk about biology when it changes so much. But when the professor finally made it clear that you can save on the numbers of experiments you would need to do with a good model, like you can remove some of the options, like, well, you can save on experiments. Now we are talking. So thinking about ODE or mass action models of cathepsin, let me move, I always stay too long on this slide. And we think about, oh man, oh, sorry, I'm skipping, I skipped one of my slides, sorry. But the cathepsins can be secreted, like the, in lysosomes we know inside of cells, can be secreted to the apical side, particularly if you're thinking about epithelial cells or endothelial cells, or also to the basolateral side, where they can be secreted into the tissue as a cancer cell might do. And so we can develop this system of equations, you know, based on, we all know the Michaelis-Smith background, but because the cysteine cathepsins have some rate of degradation, we need to include that. Or, and there's some rate that if you have inhibitors present, then they will bind that inhibitor, which will remove them from the system, um, generate our system of differential equations that we can solve simultaneously, and then we can fit our parameters such that the computational model matches experimental data that we will collect, okay? And so I was big and bold when I first started my lab, um, the biochemists had done a great job of looking at one cathepsin, one substrate, and here you'll see me focus on extracellular matrix proteins, that's where we think about. Um, so I said, well, we know the cells make multiple cathepsins, so I'm going to come in, we're going to make a model using the big four that I care about, KLSV. We know that they all can degrade these substrates, but they degrade these substrates at different catalytic rates, they bind them at different affinities, so this all isn't the same but also they are activated from the pro to the mature at different rates. And then also cystatin C is the broad spectrum cathepsin protein inhibitor that is found in all extracellular fluids. So they can bind cystatin C at different rates. But I'm gonna do all of this together because that's what computational models are good for. All right. 
then hubris comes, right? So as a young investigator, you should be bold, right? And then you do the experiment, you're like, okay. So we backed it out because we could not interpret the data realistically. And so we backed it out and said, we will look at two proteases because two is more than one. So we are moving the field forward by twofold at this point. And we were also going to keep two matrix proteins. So this became interesting to us. If we co-incubated cathepsins K and S, here's the difference. Both are really powerful elastases, okay? So degrading elastin. Cathepsin S is not a good collagenase. Type 1 collagen it does not work well on, okay? So that's the difference. But if we had them both incubated with elastin, if we cultured, um, incubated separately, you see how much cathepsin S, sorry, we're using a fluorogenic elastin peptide that when it cleaves, you get a fluorescent signal to quantify elastin cleavage. You can see how much um, cathepsin S makes and how much cathepsin K makes. But so we thought, hypothesis, is that then if they are incubated together, then you would get an additive effect because the substrate is not limiting, right? So they could degrade more substrate, the more protease. And when we did the experiment, we would only get a slight increase above cathepsin, one, the, one of the cathepsins. And I know these experiments were done well because I was doing them, right? Um, and so this puzzled us that we would repeat and repeat, and it was, we didn't really know what was happening. And I would go to the protease Gordon conferences and talk to the experts. Because even so, this curve is interesting, right? Like, why do the enzymes just stop working over time when you'd imagine there'd be this linear increase? So you talk to the protease experts, and they're like, oh, maybe it gets oxidized, or oh, they just stop working over some time, and okay. Um, but then we came back and actually did Western blots at, during the course of this experiment. And this was interesting to find is that cathepsin S protein was pretty stable over the course of the experiment, but we were losing cathepsin K. This is when they were incubated together. So we're losing cathepsin K in this system. And if we incubated cathepsin K by itself, you would still lose it, but it would last a little bit longer than if it was incubated with S. And so then when we did our zymography, which detects both K and S, you can see that by 60 minutes, you are still losing K when you still see S present. And E64 is the small molecule cathepsin inhibitor that blocks both. And so this is when we began to um, develop our hypothesis of what we call cathepsin cannibalism, where one cathepsin eats another. And so it actually was able to resolve this um, discrepancy where we had to add these terms into our computational model of S binding to K and then degrading cathepsin K. But only S that's bound to K is no longer able to be bound to elastin in that same time point. And so in doing so, we were actually able to get our model to fit because we couldn't fit the model to the data um, before this. And so then to check that it actually was relevant, we then incubated increasing amounts of cathepsin K, I'm sorry, cathepsin S to K. So started with K with the K inhibitor, um, no cathepsin S, then one one thousandth S, one one hundredth, one tenth, equal amounts, but at tenfold, cathepsin S to K ratio, you see degradation of cathepsin K by the Western blot. And if you inhibit with E64 that inhibits both, you can block it. We looked at our zymogram with the same ratios, and you can see at the tenfold amount, you see the highest amount of active cathepsin S, and you see the loss of cathepsin K in the zymogram. And then when we looked at um, incubating with collagen 1, you can see that at the tenfold amount, this is SDS page with just Kumasi staining of collagen 1. And you see at the tenfold amount, we've actually protected collagen 1. Because remember, K degrades collagen 1, S does not. So the S was degrading the cathepsin K, protecting the collagen 1 in the system. So this was quite exciting to us. And then we went back and did our full comprehensive model using all the different ratios. And you can see at the tenfold amount, you can protect the collagen 1 in the system when you have tenfold S to K. So that's great for a disease like osteoporosis, where the collagen component is the major one that's degraded, right? But not so, there's great for osteoporosis, but not so good in cardiovascular disease, where in the artery wall, there's elastin and collagen present. And because the S can degrade elastin, if you have that high amount, you'll take out the elastin at the same time. So there's some context dependence in which this can be used either therapeutically or just to be considered. And so we published this in JBC a few years ago, Jazak, he was the first author there. But it really made us start to rethink enzyme kinetics, where it was not just they both degrade substrate, but one of the proteases can degrade the other, and that removes that active enzyme in a closed system, okay? And so the way you can think about it, people have seen this meme online, young people, social media, right? So the way I like to think about it is like, collagen is here, cathepsin S is not thinking about that collagen, it's checking out cathepsin K. <laughs> <laughs> So then we go back to our combination. You're like, oh, they were eating each other. That's what we were missing in our kinetic models. Let's do the big, massive work thing again, because we can do it now. But we, let's be systematic. So we incubated each one individually. 
with the elastin substrate or with in pairs, doublets, or in triplicates, or all four together. So it's important to note that when all four together, there is four times the molar amount of total enzyme, because we just did the same molar amount for each one. But this was crazy. You would expect, again, four times to be much higher than two or three together. And why do these um, cluster together? And why do these cluster together? But then when we look, put on a different substrate, look at it with gelatin or collagen, you actually get a different ordering of these bins with a different substrate because the proteases have different preferences for different substrate. And again, all four together does not even generate the highest amount of product. And that's when we have to consider these interactions among the proteases. And so side by side, so there is this non-intuitive substrate and cannibalistic dependent influence. So a brand new graduate student, you can trick them and tell them it's a wonderful, exciting problem to tackle before they get to the challenges of it. But she graduated and she's still smiling. So we didn't break her during this process. But um, we think about when we want, we want to use computational models to describe these systems that you can't test every level experimentally. And again, this group knows about the importance of computation. And so the, the US show, maybe there's a Brazilian version of The Bachelorette, right? So the way we think about it is which model scenario is actually the right one that best approximates the experimental data. And so we think, you know, which one is the right one for us where we can generate these different enzyme systems where how do they bind substrate or each other? And then we see which run the rose fits that best captures the experimental data. And so what we've actually come up with, I'm gonna save some time and just get to the bottom of it. So this is the basic mass action model. Again, we have to include auto digestion. As I showed, cathepsin K will bind to itself and degrade itself. And there's also this inactivation where over some length of time, they will just inactivate, unfold, be oxidized. Still is a bit of a black box. But in the double cathepsin systems, again, if you just assumed inert proteases, they would never talk to each other. But we now know that there's cannibalism where it could be bidirectional. One can bind to the other degraded, but the other could bind to the other, right? And we do see back and forth in some. But we also had to describe these distraction reactions, which is where when you have inactive cathepsin or cathepsin that could be bound to an inhibitor, it can still be a substrate for its protease that wants to cleave it, which will distract it from the target substrate of the matrix protein, which changes the dynamics. And so we had to include these. And so first to do this, we um, actually did, again, two enzymes together. And because we assume these binary interactions, and you can see again, K and S together, K and L together, S and L together. This is on gelatin. These are with the enzymes um, incubated individually with the substrate. Here's them together. If there was no interactions, you would get this gray line. Um, and that's what you can see for each of these, where the gray line is much higher if there was no interactions. But we know that with the cannibalistic interactions, we were able to fit our parameters so that we could better capture this data. So we fit the models on binary protease interactions. And then to test its effectiveness, we said, if we take the parameters for two enzymes interacting and put all three together, could we predict what would happen when all three were together in the system? And again, each three individuals separately, if they did not interact with each other, what you would expect? Um, I'm sorry, on my team. No, sorry, this is actually the experimental value, sorry. Um, no, I'm sorry, this is what our model predicted. <sighs> this is what our model predicted when we took to account the two interactions together. And the dotted line is here, the actual experimental data. So it was actually pretty good for, much better for elastin than for gelatin. But we're really excited to come up with this finding um, here. Because now then, now we can take this and we put it into a fuller model system. And now we can start to do simulations of how different amounts of each of these different species can affect total substrate degradation. If you want to describe what's happening in the system or if you start inhibiting. So just for the sake of time, I showed just how we modified the distraction interactions where again, cathepsins K, L, and S all incubated together. And we have, if cathepsin K was inactive by some rate, say you inhibited K or it was unfolded. So using a cathepsin K inhibitor all alone, and if you increase the amount of inactive cathepsin K by orders of magnitude, how does it change elastin degradation? And as you can see, as you increase that amount, you get less and less elastin product being formed because the more inactive K you have, it is distracting S and L from eating the elastin and so you're getting a drop in the elastin. And again, with L, you can see how much. And then I showed these on C and D to show how much active enzyme that you will have remaining. Sorry, I don't have my bullet point. Red is um, cathepsin L and green is cathepsin S. And what's important here is when you, and when S is a distracting species, you don't get much difference. And why? S is the big bad one. S actually degrades all of the other cathepsins. And this is interesting because cathepsin S is the cathepsin that is actually stable at neutral pH. 
So it almost could be make sense in a regulatory way if S was outside of the cell and cathepsin K or L get out, S could cleave K and L and stop them from doing the activity. I don't know, I don't think there was a design to it, but these are questions that we're asking now. And so what started as a simple one on two now has turned into this complicated proteolytic network that we've been um, pro um, protesting where you can see we have the cannibalistic interactions, we have the substrate will course bound the substrate, and then we have the distraction interactions as well that all together are driving how much of that substrate gets degraded in a system. But again, important for this crowd and for us as we think about this is that inhibited cathepsins can be distracting reagents as well, okay? Because if they are still present and the enzymes can bind to a place, um, oh, sorry, and if the enzyme can still bind to a place to be distracting, then you could um, distract it from degrading the target substrate. Now, I focus on extracellular matrix as target substrates, but as we know, these proteases, they degrade cytokines, growth factors, intracellular signaling molecules. So there's a number of other targets that they have that if this was in an intracellular system, might now be affected because of these interactive things that we're seeing. And again, that's why we need a computer. And so to make it accessible for others, we actually have um, put this into an interactive online interface um, that you can actually target or modulate the amount of cathepsin K, S, or L concentration, what fraction is inactive, the screen is cut off for the, the space, you can still see it. And we have several different tabs that you can toggle to get your predictions from the computational model. Now, it is only fit for cathepsins K, L, and S, okay? So people have to do their own parameters for others, but we are now modifying it to make it where one could input their own kinetic parameters or kinetic rates to make it um, changeable. And this work is in review right now, so when it comes out, then I'll make the web website fully available for everybody. But, but then the next part of the question is, how do we parse these interactions to refine these kinetics? So we can say this modeling, but how do you really show that the biochemistry is actually happening, right? And so that's where we then turn to molecular biology. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Come along with me. Um, and so the first thing we did actually went to bioinformatics, where we wanted to say, if one protease was cleaving another, what is the site on that protease that it might be susceptible to cleaving? So MIROPS is, of course, the peptidase database that has um, this chart that has where the preferred amino acids in the, um, the S1 sites. And so what my student Megan did is she actually developed an algorithm that would slide through the entire sequence of a protein into the active site of another one and then score where the preferred site of cleavage might be. And so we call this Pac-Man. This one is published. Protease ACE cleavage from MIROPS analyzed specificities. Most people draw proteases as Pac-Man, so she came up with that name. It was pretty awesome. And if the protease is in MIROPS, it doesn't have to be a cathepsin. If the protease is in MIROPS and it has that chart, then you can put in any peptide sequence you'd like, and it will generate um, a score sheet of where it's most likely to cleave. She, she made this herself because for our cathepsins, we didn't want them cleaving in the propeptide region. Um, and then to test that and how good was Pac-Man's, we actually on cathepsin K, this is my one molecular structure, so that you all will like love me. Um, this is cathepsin K, and we actually identify that at the leucine 253 and valine 171 were the sites highest susceptible to cleavage by cathepsin S, so that we then made these cleavage site mutants. We send leucine to alanine and the L to valine here. And first we wanted to make sure there was be full protein would be expressed because that's a challenge. And we get the full length protein here, as you can see, but we wanted them to be active also because though we wanted to be mutated, we still wanted activity, but we lost activity in 253V, but A and 171A retained their activity by zymogram. And then to test if they were resistant to cleavage, we incubated them with cathepsin S. So this is S with wild type cathepsin K, and you can see you get a reduction in the amount of K protein. But when you incubated it with our cannibalism resistant mutants, you actually got a reduction in the amount of cleaved K, such that we could quantify this over the NF3. And this one still was about a 20% drop compared to the 50%. But you can see the other two actually were resistant to cleavage by cathepsin S. And so just I'll zoom through this last part. So done, right? We know this cannibalism interactions are driving things and that's gonna be important. So now we can figure out what's going on, right? Except no, cells change everything, everything. Oh. So you get another new student and you tell them, hey, you're gonna work on a project. We can... <laughs> but cells have protein synthesis. They transport these things, they activate the enzymes. And of course the feedback loops, right? That are not being figured out. So just in this brief last part, the cellular feedback loops in response to cathepsin inhibition. What's happening? Not well done. So one thing, our first big entrance here was that my student incubated E64 with these breast cancer cells. Um, 
And we did our zymogram expecting to see a drop in the active protease. But what she actually saw by zymogram was an increase in the amount of cathepsin S, and then you lose active cathepsin L, okay? But the protein levels were not changing um, as you increase the amount of E64. We did it with macrophages, THP1 macrophages. You see a similar effect. You also get increased cathepsin V in the macrophages, increased S, but you lose cathepsin L, the active amount. What's happening? E64 binds all of these enzymes, okay? And so even if you look at it over time, you can still see there's a time-dependent factor. You increase with the highest amount. Now, I say this, this is a really high amount of E64, but we do this because E64 does not cross the cell membrane, but the cells will uptake it by endocytosis, and then it will then fuse with endosomes and have access to the vesicular cathepsins, and that's why we use that. Um, but also cystatin C, the protein inhibitor. So it's not just the small molecule. The molecule is about 400 grams per mole. Cystatin C is 13,000 grams per mole. Even still, inhibiting, incubating the cells with cystatin C, you get an increase in the amount of active cathepsin S and a decrease in the amount of active cathepsin L, suggesting something about inhibiting the cathepsins may be driving this regulation. Again, these are just suggestions. But there was actually a paper that came out in 2014 from a clinical study, phase one clinical study, from Eli Lilly using a cathepsin S inhibitor. And they found that in their patients with the um, cathepsin inhibitor, there was an increased amount, increased amount of cathepsin S and also an increased amount of activity from cathepsin S when given a cathepsin S inhibitor to humans. So this is, this drug clearly has not made it to market, um, but this actually kind of helped bolster what we were seeing in our little cellular experiments. And so again, with our whole idea about trying to repurpose some of these cathepsin inhibitors, again, the inhibitors that have made it to, um, to clinical trials have different ways of entering the cells. And so what we've been able to do, again, I'm skipping a lot of the details for the sake of time, is we would model inhibitors as E64, again, had to be endocytosed to fuse with vesicles. E64D is the modulated form that can cross the cell membrane, but an esterase will then cleave that D piece, leaving it inside of the cytoplasm for intracellular cathepsin inhibition. And then, again, there have been a number of lysosomotropic cathepsin inhibitors that cross membranes to enter the lysosomes. And so we looked at um, our interesting results that we got from the breast cancer cells. And again, in fitting our models to it, again, we could talk offline about how we did this. But you can see here that with E64, you do, we were able to model that you will get an increase in active cathepsin S because of the compartment where S is. S was inside of vesicles in these breast cancer cells. Cathepsin L, on the other hand, a small amount was in vesicles, but a large amount was in the cytoplasm. And so E64 would take a longer time to inhibit L. And this is demonstrated here from our own data. Then when we used E64D, it would inhibit cathepsin L almost immediately, but it, took, it would not really do so much with cathepsin S, which again, so is here from my zymogram where L is blocked with E64D after just four hours. And then when we use a lysosomotropic one, you can see that you would get this um, amount of active S, but lose the amount of L in these systems. And so all of that together, studying cathepsins is difficult. <laughs> I think you all know this. Great. Studying cathepsis in cells is even more ridiculously difficult. We're working on it. Please come along. But the payoff of studying cathepsis, I think, could be significant for a number of diseases. And I think if we can get one of these inhibitors to market and one in patients, that we can start looking at the data, I think, and open the door for the others. And again, I think it takes a number of different types of approaches to tackle these problems. So I'm one, happy to see all the approaches you all are taking. Here are some of the ones we're taking and love to keep working together in the future. So stay in the fight, okay? And love to thank my group. Um, this is actually, my lab got together for my 10-year anniversary. Last year, they had a big surprise. I did not know this was happening. Uh, so these are a lot of my former grad students, former postdocs, undergrads that were in med school and grad school, and some family members. So really thankful for that. And funding that has helped me. Check me out. I'm on Twitter, following this guy now. And thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much for a great talk. Uh, uh, we've got time for some questions. Let's see. Carlos. Uh, oh, hold on. Oh, no. We've got a question from the back. Let's start. There you go, Deborah. Thanks. Uh, do you think we should keep uh, looking for selectivity or move target strategy? <laughs> so that's right. So this is what I, I worry that some of the, I worry that we don't need full selectivity, but I think we need to understand if there are inhibitors that can modulate multiple proteases at different ways, then you might be able to have 
a better effect for side effects, right? Because the way that we hypothesize, if you knock out, say, say you knock out Cathepsin S, okay? Then now K is no longer being degraded. So K can kind of rise up and L can rise up. But if you have an inhibitor that knocks S down, but also has some cross-reactivity for K and L, could that be more beneficial than just punching a hole in the system? That's what we think. But that's why we want to model it computationally first to kind of see if the effects that we would predict would be worth developing that type of inhibitor. So our strategy is if it's worth developing, but you all already have all of these molecules that would be nice to screen to see if you see differential effects. Yes, first of all, thank you very much for that very nice and live talk. And I'm also happy that you survived yesterday for the Kuiperians. <laughs> Uh, and also, I have to thank you because two days ago, Professor Giuliano almost killed me, and now you rescued me. So I'm glad for that as well. Uh, uh, my first question was actually going that direction. And uh, when you showed the slide on the catepsins network, so uh, that means that you would like really to go for some kind of polypharmacology that then you could, you know, modulate all these proteins at once. I think for extracellular matrix degradation, yes, right? Because they're all in the same compartment, which would be the extracellular environment. I think depending on the cathepsin disease being looked at, so I, I don't know where cruzane is inside of the organism, but if that is inside of a vesicle or an organ, the lysosome. So then you would just need those proteins in that lysosome to be modified. So I think whatever ones are in the same compartment might need to be considered in their joint regulation. If there's like, this one's in the lysosome and this one is funneled out, then we don't need to think about the one that's not local. Just a comment actually, because this is something the way that uh, cruzane does as well when T. cruzai is infecting uh, hot cells because cruzane can also this sort of cannibalism by eating the proteins from the hot cell. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I got the order. Uh, first, Professor Goodchow. Oh, oh, okay, I, I'll go. A tough question, please. So, uh, thanks. Uh, try to give a short question. The others will also ask a lot. Um, so, it would be interesting to to know kinetic uh, data for one catepsin being a substrate of the other one. So, how could that be managed? For example, one one could think about inhibiting um, one catepsin with an irreversible inhibitor and then um, providing it to the other catepsin and then making the uh, I mean, KM over KK determination. Uh, but, but, but before you should do that, you, you should uh, be careful to get rid of the excess inhibitor. Uh, this is not so easy. So, and uh, moreover, you need a lot of material, which is also uh, in this, those cases not so, not so cheap. So, this is not really a question, but maybe you, you thought about that conflict that can arise from that. Oh, I no, so we have tried this, and you bring up the good points. So we've tried it with pre-incubating with E64 and then trying to then add that to the new enzyme. But you've got to remove all the unlabel or the, the free inhibitor. Then if you dialyze it, do you lose the active enzyme over that time? Because there's a time component where they just start to no longer work. But what we, what we have done is we have made active site dead cathepsins. So the active site, that's how we try, want to resolve the kinetics. If the one substrate protease cannot cleave the other, then now we want to look at those kinetics, but we now just have to purify those and surround those exams, right? But but if but if you all again, if you have very specific or more selective irreversible inhibitors, that might work. We were using E64, that's what we had, that but it binds to many of them. But if there's a selective inhibitor like you know these ones that you all talk about that could keep that one out, then we could refine the kinetics. Okay, Professor Giuliano, and then Lorenzo. Hi. <laughs> It's a nice enthusiasm. <laughs> However, uh, this this equation is more complicated than just catepsin. And uh, in the last two years, I have been working uh, uh, with uh, interleu interleukin 10 receptor. An interleukin 10 receptor is hydrolyzed by some proteases. So you lost the anti-inflammatory activity of IL-10 because you lose uh, the receptor. 
and, and this is very clear in prostate inflammation, in prostate hyperplasia. It's very clear. And uh, the amount of uh, catepsins depend, uh, re released by mass, uh, macrophage, uh, depends on the stimulation of interleukins. So you have a, another cascade, very complicated one, uh, that the amount of uh, the response depends on, on, not only on the amount of uh, interleukin you have, but depends on the concentration of the receptor. So the receptors are controlled by the protease. This is a fascinating yeah. situation. Yeah. Complicated, but fascinating. So as a quick response, this is why I think it's important to appreciate, which I'm glad you bring up, the other targets of the cysteine proteases. Because again, then if you say we're to block the protease that was degrading that one, would you get some over-inflammatory response, but then do you block the enzyme in the macrophage, so then there's a different thing. So that's why we are really starting to look at other non-ECM targets that drive cellular behavior. And that's an important one that we need to look into. So very nice talk, very interesting. Uh, just, I think a comment with what Professor Gucci say. Uh, I don't know, maybe just an idea that come out now, probably a, a way to solve it will be using ITC, so you don't need a substrate. You just titate your enzyme with another enzyme, and maybe you get something. I don't know, just just an idea, whatever. So the the question was actually, you use just irreversible inhibitors for your study. Did you try to use any reversible inhibitor? Because most of the compounds that we have now in clinical trial are actually are reversible or even not covalent. So can you use your techniques to do this? Uh, so we have. <laughs> You also need to publish stuff, right? <laughs> or the complete stuff. We have run through a range of inhibitors. We haven't used as many inhibitors looking at the proteolytic network modulation because we got to this part after we started to see the two and we've kind of shifted. We've used a number of other inhibitors for some of the disease systems that we look at, um, but we haven't used reversible as much. But in the um, online interface, uh, you can actually put in the KD values or the K on and K off rates and model different inhibitors. So those are ones we want to use. And again, we will test whatever inhibitors you all send us. Advertisement. OK, okay let's thank Professor Platt again for an excellent talk. And uh, and uh, hold on. our next speaker is uh, Professor Paolo Cesar Vera. Uh, he received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees uh, in chemistry from the University of Sao Paulo. He currently is a full professor at the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at, uh, at, uh, at Hebrew Prater. He is, has experience in uh, chemistry of natural products and discovery of compounds with antimicrobial and antiparasitic activity. Professor Vera will be presenting the work Cysteine Protease Inhibitors. Professor Vera. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, before I start my presentation, I should make some comments. I think they are. Uh, appropriate for this time. The first one is that uh, I've been work. I, I worked actually in the, at the Federal University of San Carlos for 36 years, so some people don't or have not realized yet that I moved to another institution in Ribeirão Preto. Now I've been a professor at uh, School of Pharmaceutical Sciences since uh, two, 2018, so I'm one year there. And second is that uh, well, before, after the first presentation, I don't know what I should do here, because <laughs> first, because my English is quite broken, and secondly, because he had very nice uh, talk about catepsin, so I'm not a catepsinist. I don't study catepsins, I just use them. So I hope you understand my point. Uh, but anyway, uh, as I'm chemist, I'm going to explore very much the chemistry so we can I uh, have uh, the two topics together and perhaps get some uh, new insights about this work. So uh, uh, thanks uh, Carlos, Jerónimo, and Andre for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be in this meeting. Uh, I think that we can learn a lot of it, but unfortunately I could, I could not come in the first two days and you may know that we're in the end of the semester. So uh, it seems that everything happened at the end of semester. So we don't have much time to be around 
and that's why I could not come the first two days. So I should thank also my, the university I'm working now, the um, School of Pharmacy, oops, sorry, it's here, the School of Pharmaceutical Science, University of Sao Paulo, and the group I belong now, the Natural Products uh, Group in, in the, the same uh, in, uh, school. And I'm gonna talk with you about system protease inhibitors. And before I start that, I should thank Carlos Montanari, who is a kind of a stronghold for medicinal camps in Brazil. So I, I really appreciate, uh, Carlos, what you've been doing for medicinal camps in our country. Um, so this is the outline of I'm gonna uh, uh, talk today. I think I should skip lots of this cysteine protease before, after the, the first talk. Dr. Platts too does a lot of it. So perhaps I, if I try to say something, I could be wrong. So I don't want to get into this field just to be uh, sacrifices in the, in the end. Uh, so, but one thing that I'm going to talk about is that uh, about plants. So, uh, there's this site, uh, this website, Plants for a Future. It's no longer like this because this picture was taken a couple of years ago. But what we find there that plants have been used for different purposes for the humans. So, we know that plants uh, came to Earth before humans. So, since our very beginning on the Earth, we've been playing with plants for many purposes. One of them certainly is for food. Nobody can deny that, but we also use them for as medicinal plants. We use them uh, for gardening, for uh, lots of paints and uh, pigments, lots of things. So uh, one of the ways that we think that using plants is okay is for medicinal purpose. Uh, since the, the we are in, on the earth, we've been doing that. And there are some, uh, actually, many examples of using of the, of the use of plants for uh, getting um, drugs. So this one uh, example I like very much. This one, uh, I know this is different from the previous speaker. I'm just show, I'm already showing some structures here. They are not sometimes not, not so welcome by the audience. But anyway, as I told you, I'm chemist. So this is quinine. Quinine appeared a long time ago for the treatment of malaria. And this, uh, this compound was isolated from this plant in China. And this was found back in the 70th century, something like that. So how this compound was found? Uh, it was found when the, 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 the civilization of, of the uh, South America started in Peru, the Spanish people coming to Peru, they, they found out, they realized that the native Indians there used to take the uh, a kind of tea from the, the barks of this plant. And when they would take the, 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 that, that, that tea, they would take that when they had symptoms of fever. So after that, the studying the, the in correlating the fever and the, what there the was in the plant, it was found uh, that the, the symptoms of fever was, ca was caused by malaria. And taking the tea from the, the, the bark of this plant, they would get a relief from that, that, that problem. And that was due to the presence of quinine. So quinine was used and for a long time for the treatment of malaria. But all, all, I think almost every, every one of us know uh, the res resistance from the parasite uh, has led to the development of new uh, anti-malarial uh, products. And based on quinine, uh, we had chloroquine that was derived. This was a syntax der the, the derivative uh, prepared, not, not coming not from plants, but uh, from organic labs. And after that, the still the same problem of uh, resistance. Uh, Years, uh, decades ago, I think 30 or 40 years ago, 40 years ago, we found again from plants a, with this compound, this is called artemisinin, that was uh, used. The plant was used from the, in the traditional uh, Chinese traditional medicine for the treatment of, of malaria as well. So we studied that plant, this compound was found, and today this is the uh, only treatment, not exactly this one, but the, the derivative from that artesanate that is called, the derivative from artemisinin is used for uh, uh, 
resistant strains from uh, plasmodium that cause the uh, malaria. So uh, this uh, work was very well recognized in 2015 when this uh, scientist, Yu Yu Tu, uh, got the Nobel Prize on Physiology or Medicine. So this was a recognition of the natural products work of this uh, lady on this Artem Artemisia annua, that's the species that affords this Artemisinin. So as you can see, uh, the motivation for this prize was for her discoveries referring to the new, sorry for this uh, mistake, new therapies against malaria. And the title of her presentation when she was awarded with this prize was Artemisinin, a gift from traditional med Chinese medicine to the world. So you can see that this is quite clear that it's possible to explore the nature for finding new medicines. And this is a kind of recognition for the field. Actually, natural product has not been kind of well recognized as a good field for working in the discovery of new drugs. But quite often we get a new information, new uh, compound that uh, turns our minds back to the, how useful these natural products are. So at the same time, the, the actor, she uh, was awarded with these two other uh, men, uh, Satoshi Omur and Willie Campbell, but in this case, was the, the compounds are not from plants, and this was from microorganisms, and this was the motivation for the discoveries referring to new therapies against infectious disease caused by nematode parasites. And in their presentation for in the Nobel Prize Award, the Satoshi Omura had the, 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 his presentation has a, the title "Explained Gifts from the Earth, the Origins and Impact of Ivermectin." So, and from William Campbell, he he did some modification on this structure, giving to going from Ivermectin to Ivermectin a reflection on simplicity. So. Uh, I think these examples, that uh, there are many of them, uh, can uh, help us to convince people that work with nature or from, with natural products from nature uh, is a good uh, way to get nice results. So, and also we can find from the, in the literature, this is a very, quite well known, perhaps it was already cited in this meeting, but uh, this is a review from Newman and Craig, they've been reviewing how uh, new uh, sources of therapeutic agents have been developed in the past few years. They are, in the, especially in the third or fourth years. And you see, you see that natural products represent quite a large percent percentage of new chemical entities, new compounds being used as therapeutic agents. So I, I think that now you are convinced that it's a good idea to study natural products. And then that's where I'm going to focus later. So what we do? So we know that there are many uh, compounds that should hit their target to, to be important as uh, to control some physiological processes. So uh, we have many structures. And as I like structures, I'm going to show a lot of them here just to tell you that these compounds are in plants or other living organisms. So it's a good way to find new uh, useful products, just look at the plants. And I, I should not miss this one. That is, uh, this is Vimblastine, Vincristine, that has been one of the, two of the most famous anti-tumor compounds. So this is also anti-tumor, taxol, these are atropine, at, 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 atropines, and uh, some other compounds. These are uh, steroidal compounds for uh, using in the control of blood pressure, quinine, etc. So, we, some time ago, we got interested in on the cysteine protease. I'm not going to detail anything about it. Just to tell you that uh, I I learned that there were 11 members. Now I, I think this number is a little bit higher because every day new information about catepsin has been appearing in the literature. But anyway, uh, we started our work, especially. Uh, looking for inhibitors for catepsin B, L, and K, and, I'm, and V. I'm going to focus my presentation on that and uh, how we approach this problem. So uh, Brazil, as you may know, or especially the, the Brazilians certainly know, but the foreigners may not know that Brazil is a very big country. 
So when we look at the biomes in Brazil, everybody has heard about the Amazon, about a huge, very large area, and it has been destroyed uh, every day at a very high proportion, very high rate. But we also have Cerrado, that's this orange, or at least for me, sorry, I don't know for you, because uh, each of us has a one way to see colors. <laughs> uh, this is a very large area, also being destroyed for, especially for the plant, soy, uh, soybean plantation. And they have here, the Caatinga is a kind of dry uh, and arid place in the, in the northeast of Brazil. If you look, this blue area is the coast zone, close to the sea. The Atlantic forest that we have only a very, very small percent of remaining original uh, Atlantic forest, and in the south, the Pampas, and here, the Pantanal. So uh, being in Brazil, it's quite easy to just look outside and see a plant that could be useful for uh, something. So just uh, giving you a better idea how it looks like. So if you are in the Amazon area, you can see things like this. So uh, green areas, lots of water. So this blue area is like that. So in the Caatinga, it's dry. So the vegetation changed quite a lot. So we believe the chemistry of those plants. In the savanna, that's a kind of cerrado we call in Brazil. Uh, also different in the Atlantic forest, quite different environment. So it would be expected that we just look at the plants, the chemistry should be different. And also, I'm not only talking about chemistry, about plants, but if you look uh, in the microbiome of these uh, regions, we would have lots of, uh, of microorganisms that should, could be also useful. So this is another plant. This, for example, mangrove like this, we have kind of different biodiversity, different uh, organisms. And so we have lots of uh, way to find useful uh, plants for working. So uh, in, this, this part, in this part of the talk, I'm gonna talk with you about the Cerrado plants. Cerrado is a kind of dry uh, soil, but we have some, sometimes have fires during the, the, the year. That's caused by man, but we, people sometimes say that is natural. That's not any natural. The only natural reason for having fire uh, uh, in the, the Cerrado is for when we have thunderstorms in the dry season. Uh, sometimes we have the thunder and then we have the, the lights, lightning, and this cause fire. But anyway, we have a very large uh, biome, and uh, this biome, 22%, is in the Brazilian territory. We have endemic species, and it has been devastated by agriculture. So many of these species, uh, natural from this area, uh, are endangered. So uh, we, uh, the, the, the example I'm going to discuss with you refers to this plant, Myrcea lingua. This is a Myrtaceae. There are some characteristics of this plant here. But there are some other previous report on this plant. These are the kind of compound that have been found in, the, in, the, in this Myrtaceae family. As you may know, if not, I can tell you that this, it seems that the, the different plant families, they specialize some uh, metabolites. Sometimes we have this general uh, chemistry for all the plants, but sometimes we have specialized metabolites for plants. So these are the kind of metabolites that are found in Myrtaceae. So uh, this species has not been studied before, and this is the this young lady is the one who uh, did this work. So what we do? We prepare an extract, and then we do what is called bioguided isolation. We try to, to have all the, the, because we are trying to find inhibitors for the enzyme, so we should have a, a assay that we could rely on and try after the assay to get the pure compounds and study how they behave uh, in inhibiting the, 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 the enzyme. So here you can see we had, uh, in this study we had the number of extracts here, 15. We did this kind of very common work on uh, chemistry labs. I'm not going into detail on that. So we study, should study uh, extraction, isolation, assays, a mechanism of inhibition. And here is how the, the work is done. Once you have pure compounds, you go to enzymatic com uh, assays, try to find active compounds. And then we do this structural modification and do some other studies. 
it's quite easy to run the DSA, but of course we have some problems as usual. So we have the enzymatic assay we do with the catepsin is quite uh, similar. It's some very a small change from one catepsin to the other, but the idea is to study the the ability of the enzyme to to cleave the substrate. You may have heard that before, but anyway, we study by fluorescence. So fluorescence is the way we find uh, how the if the inhibitor is doing what we expect them to do is to inhibit the activity of the enzyme. Because if the, the enzyme is not active, we don't get this fluorescent uh, sub, uh, uh, compound. And so uh, that's good for us. So the first example I'm gonna share with you are these very common and simple structures found in many uh, plants in nature. So what are these compounds? These are very well known triterpenes. They are very simple structures. You see there's only, only mostly carbon and hydrogen, just, just uh, two carbon atoms here in this carboxylic OH and then uh, uh, ester in this part. So what we, when we, we, we isolate this kind of compound and we found that it had some inhibitory activity on catepsin, we said, wow, these are a very common structure. You can play a little bit with chemistry in the, on this part of the molecule and this part of the molecule. What most uh, medicinal chemists do, I'm not, any medicinal chemist, I just do some chemistry. And the first thing you realize that when you just sterify, get a, a methyl ester in this position, the activity, inhibitory activity is lost. So this carboxylic moiety is important for the inhibitory activity on catepsin B and L. You see that we have different uh, inhibitory activities for, for catepsin B. Usually these triterpenes are not active. For catepsin L, they have some activity. For example, when you come from this compound to this one, the only thing missing here is this acetyl group. We, have, we see that there, there is change in the inhibitory capacity. And also, when you come from this compound to that one, the difference is the epimerization of this hydroxyl, that here is the beta position, this is an alpha position, and then we have differences in the activity. So these are some molecular features that we found that are important for uh, uh, the selectivity of the activity of these compounds through catepsin B and catepsin L. Just reminding and making clear that these triterpenes are mostly uh, active against catepsin L, not catepsin B. And then we just move it a little bit further. So uh, sometimes we don't have this from plant, but you can easily find the, 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 the compound from a uh, uh, company like Sigma Odyssey. So we bought this compound. If we just come back here and see the difference in the structure, this one has these two methyl groups and separate the different carbons here. The, this one is another kind of skeleton with the two methyl groups in the same carbon. And then they do the same thing. So uh, we acetylate and then uh, this is position. And then we move, move it from here to there. You see that the, there's no much difference in the, the, the activity against just look at catepsin L, that's what is, is important in this case. So when we ex uh, the oxidation of this hydroxyl in this uh, carbon-3 gave this compound also not much difference in the, in the, in the activity, double, we decrease the half of the, the activity of that one. But what is interesting here is that when we just have this very simple reaction, going from a ketone to an oxym, we found that this compound is, uh, much, uh, has a much higher activity. So uh, we thought, we think that going from th this way to here, so we got some improvement there. Uh, unfortunately, this just stopped it there. Uh, we, we, we made some uh, uh, molecular modeling, uh, but we could not go further. And you know, sometimes we change projects and then there's a, uh, uh, and in the future, you ask yourself, why did I change it? But anyway, uh, the, the same plant, we found. We also found this flavonoid. Flavonoid is a very common compound. They are found almost everywhere. everywhere. But what is interesting is that the flavonoids, the flavonoids had higher activity against catepsin B than catepsin L. So when we first prepared the extract of that plant, it got activity against both enzymes. But interestingly, is that one class of compound inhibits one enzyme and the other class of compound inhibits mostly the other. So this, we had also 
number of uh, examples here of this how, how this uh, activity was related to, to the to the structure. For example, just removing the sugar unit from here have a much simpler structure, and the activity get better. You see, we we'll go from 37 to 37 to 4. And so we had, again, a number of these components, and we saw that uh, these hydroxyl groups were important for the, the activity. If we go from here, three hydroxyl in this position to two into one, we see a decrease in the, in the activity. Some people say that this uh, catechol uh, system and this uh, pyrogalol system, they are promiscuous. Well, I think they are promiscuous, but we can play with that uh, in different occasions. So let's say again the, the importance of the sugar units. So we can see that when the, the, the have a sugar, it doesn't depend much on the, 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 the sugar have here, so the, the, the activity is about the same. The difference when we, we move from this three hydroxyl here to this two, the, the activity decrease. So uh, playing with this different compound had a kind of uh, overview of how uh, important are are the each uh, part of the molecule for the activity. For example, in the previous uh, slide you had, we we're talking about flavonols, the, the compound that has this kind of this hydroxyl in this position. This one has no the, the hydroxyl in the carbon three. When you compare with the one with the hydroxyl in the carbon three, we see that the activity is a bit higher. So these are some features that we found for, for this, this compound. Again, so if you compare this one, this has this ring C, is uh, we have carbon, sp3 carbons here, and hydroxyl at carbon three. When you compare this compound, the activity of this compound with this one that has this flat uh, ring here and all conjugated to this part of the molecule, we come from a low activity to a higher activity in this molecule. So this gave us a lot of information about this plant, and then we could see that we have actually two different class of compounds, one inhibiting catepsin B and the other one inhibiting catepsin L. So at the, that time that we had this, uh, had this student, uh, she was working with another plant, this is a, this is a rutaceae, uh, and uh, she did some work on cruzine, and the same approach we had before, so we just had different fractions from a, from a, a ex, an extract, and then we saw which one had the best inhibitory activity, and so we decided to work with this one. This is one a, a fraction that came from this uh, fraction of dichloromethane, and we had the 79% inhibitory activity. So we decided to focus on this fraction, and then isolate the compound. So what we got from this uh, uh, work, we also had some noun compounds. This, this part of the, the, the top uh, structures here are noun compounds. They are very well known as quinoline alkaloids. So we, we've been playing with this class of compounds for a long time. So I uh, had a kind of, uh, it's easy for us just to, to get the structures from uh, the NMR spec. This one were a new compound. When you look at this compound, you see that it's very well related, correlated with the structure of these two ones. And then when we, we could also propose a biosynthetic pathway coming from this intermediate, going to this one, getting to this, this, this third one that's also present in the plant. And we, in the same plant, we got this dihydrogel cones that are here, so we have this four, they have the chalcon, they're, they're structurally related. We can see that this chalcon, they have this C6, three C6 carbon. These are extra moieties that are put on the, the molecule in the uh, biosynthetic process. But when you compare with, with th these two ones with this other one, we see that these have this hydroxyl groups there. So this, we think that they are important for the, the activity and when you compare this to one, we see here you have a, a six-member ring in the bionzopyran ring, and here you have a, a ten-member ring with metal groups in different positions. So when I say this compound against cruzine, we got this the, this IC50, not so good, but the best ones were this, uh, as I mentioned before, having the hydroxyl in this position. 
So uh, we did the same for the, the alkaloids. This, as I mentioned, these are precursors of this, this ones, but we found that these two ones, they had not so high uh, activity against cruzine. Uh, but one thing that is interesting that is easily seen that when we change from this drug to that one, just missing this hydroxyl, we lose the, uh, the activity. So this hydroxyl is important for the, the activity on cruzine. And the same happens here. When we just replace this methyl to a hydrogen, we also lose the activity. We, we have half of the, the activity. So I'm gonna skip this because it's a, a, a compound that we check the activity on different strains of, of plasmodium uh, falciparum and go to again to the catepsin, but now uh, talking about the activities uh, of the, those alkaloids and the other shell coins I mentioned before. So what did we got? This kind of, these alkaloids, they are not so uh, potent against uh, uh, catepsin. And when you compare catepsin L and catepsin B, uh, they, they have no activity against catepsin L, only against a uh, catepsin on catepsin B and not so high, not so potent. When we got these two compounds that I mentioned that they, are, they were new at that time, so we found that they, they had different uh, activities comparing the, the one that has this methyl and the one without methyl, about uh, half of the activity when we get, we replace the methyl group by the hydrogen, the same thing we found for cruzine. But the interesting thing that we found was when we check it for these four dihydrochalk ones. So when they see this dihydrochalk one, one and two, one and two are here, we have this part of the molecule, these extra rings, not hydroxyl, we found that this compound, sorry. Oh, there the oh, sorry. Uh, they, we found that this compound, they inhibit catepsin B. Not so potent, but uh, in some way. Not, they don't inhibit uh, catepsin L. On the other hand, these two other compounds having the hydroxyl groups, they inhibit, they're quite potent against catepsin L, on catepsin L, but not on catepsin B. So these are structural features that we thought that would be interesting to explore a little bit more. So the last part of my talk, uh, I'm gonna focus on this work. This, this was a uh, work made by this young man. At that time he was much younger, he was uh, 10 years younger. This started 10 years ago. Uh, and this guy came to my lab uh, with an idea to explore the, the chemistry of uh, plants that were used or have been used as medicinal plants to treat bone disease. So I said, this is, could this be due to the presence of catepsin K inhibitors? So I just decided to explore this possibility. And then we had a collection of plants, but the one that he focused mainly were this sixth one here. So these are, this is ginger, very well, uh, known by uh, everyone. This is curcuma. I forgot the name of this. This is a termera, termera. Yeah. And these are also other plants that I uh, have only. This is uh, cat's claw. But anyway, we did the same as we re usually do with our extract. We prepared the extract from all the plants and checked it for the activity on catepsin K. And what we found that these two plants had the good activities. So I decided to focus on ginger. It's very well known, very easy access. Also curcuma is also, uh, this termera is also uh, easy to get. So, and what we had before the, the, this, about these plants. There is the, there are these two uh, papers. There are some other, but uh, the, the, the time we had this one, what this guy says. They studied this gingiber uh, officinale, this is ginger, a traditional medicine. It's, used, it's from Chinese, Indian, and Greek. They use it for treatment of arthritis. So, and what they, they said in these this two papers that when you have the extract of this plant, there is one fragment that is, quite, that is rich in this kind of compound that are known as ginger rolls. This ginger rolls, this fraction, uh, decreases the arthritic index 
when compared with uh, the, a, a, a blank. And also the, the dichloromethane extract had a much higher activity. So this, uh, this fraction was active from this fraction, it got this ginger ale fraction, and that, that, the, that also had activity. And I said, well, this is a good indication that we can, if we study a little bit further this, the, this extract, this plant, we can may end up with the active compound against uh, uh, on, on catepsin K. And this is a kind of same kind of result uh, we had for, for this, this uh, paper. So what we did, so we did the, the, the same as usual. So we prepared the extract and try to check it for the activity and isolate the compound. And when we isolate the pure compound, we ended up with this uh, ginger rolls. Ginger rolls are uh, compounds that are, uh, had, have this kind of, oh, let me start from here. So this is a more common ginger oil. This is called six ginger oil. It has this uh, phenolic uh, moiety. And we have this carbon chain here. It's a linear carbon chain. In this carbon chain, you have a carbonyl and the carbon starting from here, one, two, three. And then in the beta position, we have a hydroxyl. This hydroxyl uh, group is quite well known, at the, including the absolute stereochemistry. And what changed from one ginger oil to the other is the length of this carbon chain. So it's commonly, uh, they commonly appear as a mixture of what they call six, eight, and 10 ginger oil. And, but there are some uh, uh, variation of that. If we uh, look at this structure as chemists, we see that this alcohol sometimes dehydrates quite easily. In this case, it's not quite easy, but it happens. And you get to this compound, this double bond conjugate, which is carbonyl. This class of compounds, even though they are called ginger oil, they are, have a specific name of sugar. Also, we find different lengths for the carbon chain. So when a chemist see this kind of compound, it's easy to see, well, uh, even though I'm not a synthetic chemist, I can do some structural modification. And that was what we did. Uh, every undergrad student on, on chemistry knows that uh, this carbonyl undergoes easily an, ad an addition of uh, nitrogenated compounds. So we could make this compound, it's a nitrogen, that's nucleophile, there's another one, there's other one, this was interesting. Anyway, so we, mod we had this uh, modification of in the structures and we tried the IC50, got some bad inhibition, because but the idea was to go a little bit further and see uh, if the structural modification could get an improvement in the inhibitory activity, and also uh, uh, to see if we could uh, run this assays on cell. So, so from all the, the results we had, uh, we, we decided to uh, take these three, these three compounds to uh, check for the activities that go, could inhibit uh, catepsin K inside the cells. So these are the ICFs, they are not so good, but anyway, there's, there's 17, 10, and 23. There are reasons why we, we uh, decided to go for these compounds. It, it depends on solubility and a number of other reasons. But anyway, we, we focused on this six ginger oil derivative we prepared in the lab. This thin ginger oil, that's a, a compound that occurs as a natural product. And this six sugar oil that also occurs as a natural product. So how to, to determine the, the activity? There is this assay that is uh, that, uh, to determine the, the, enzymatic, the enzymatic activity in the cell culture. So again, we have, we have to have uh, cells that express or produce quite a lot of uh, catepsin. We have this, we know that chondrocytes are rich in catepsin, so we use these cells. And how do we, do we run this assay? We use the substrate. When the, the, the enzyme is active, it breaks the, the, this, this bond and releases this amino uh, methyl anthracene, naphthalene, sorry. So in the middle, we have this nitro benzaldehyde. So it condenses with this amino group and gives this 
precipitate that is green. So it gives high fluorescence uh, under uh, UV light, fluorescent light, sorry. And then here, the, the wavelengths, we explored that. So the visualization through a uh, confocal microscopy, we can see. So what we get from this result, if the plate is green, so it does mean that the enzyme is active. So this process is going through the formation of this product. If the, the plate is black, so the, the result is the compounds are inhibiting the activity of the of catepsin K. So that's what we did. So uh, this is uh, the, the assay with uh, inhibition of catepsin K. So this is our control. Uh, this is Brazilian control, the Portuguese control. Is an E here, <laughs> so and then you see the green, uh, the green uh, spots here, meaning that the, the enzyme has activity. So I use this E64 that has already mentioned, been mentioned before. That's an inhibitor for quite all many of the catepsin. So at the the concentration of one micromolar, we can see the plate all black. So this means that this inhibitor is inhibiting the activity of catepsin. Okay. We had this synthetic product at this concentration. So we get a black plate. So enzyme is inhibited. This is a 10 ginger oil. This is how it's found in the, in the ginger. So one micromolar, some spots not inhibiting all the activity of the catepsin, of catepsin K. But this six sugar oil, that's also found as a natural product in ginger, inhibited. Uh, the activity of uh, catepsin K. So we were quite sure at this point that this compounds found in, in ginger really inhibit the activity of catepsin K uh, inside the cells. Of course, for these cells, we should proceed further to know if this would be the reason why this taking this plant can prevent some bone disease. But just to see some kind of selectivity, when we, we run the same assay on catepsin B, B, we found the control is green, but we also found that even uh, E64 doesn't hit quite well catepsin B, B in cells, but our compound did almost didn't inhibit the catepsin B in the control sites. So uh, doing this kind of uh, approach, we saw that this compound could be uh, more selective to catepsin K than catepsin B. So at this point, we just get to the concluding remarks for this presentation. So uh, we, we think that this approach to isolate enzyme inhibitors from crude extract of plants, conduct the identification of number compounds, inhibitor compounds. So we think that if we're careful enough, we can follow this procedure to get to, into pure compound <laughs> that are good inhibitors for enzyme. It's not so easy. We have a lot of uh, factors uh, complicating this kind of approach. Like, for example, if you have, if you have a fluorescence compound, they don't work. Sometimes this is a very high, big mixture. Like if you have tannins, the, the compound, the, the, the assay don't work. So, but anyway, if you are careful enough, we can get in, end up with isolated compound having the activity. So when we use this extract of this plant, Mircea, Mircea uh, lingua, we could uh, differentiate two dis the different class of compounds, one inhibiting catepsin B and the other one inhibiting catepsin L. Uh, simple structural modification uh, could uh, permit us to check for small features in the molecules is responsible for the activity of, uh, of this special destroyed terpenes on catepsin uh, L and B. And also, this is, I think, the, 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 the final part of the presentation, studying a plant with now medicinal properties, it was possible to isolate compounds responsible for the inhibition of catepsin K activity in cells. So certainly, this is only uh, the beginning of a long way to go. But with that, I'd like to thank uh, the, the in Brazil, we are facing a number of problems now, but we should thank CAPES, NPQ, and FAPESP, CAPES, and CNPQ, especially FAPESP. CNPQ 
is a kind of a short, uh, short in Monday. Caps is still working. We don't know until when. Uh, and I, I would love, I'd like uh, to uh, thank again my the university I'm working today in my group, and certainly I should thank Sanka Med Camp 2019, the organizer of the meeting for inviting me, and participate at least at least a little bit of the meeting that I would very much like to participate more. But anyway, I'm here, and I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have. Are we ready for some questions? Oh. Thanks, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, you have some problems with uh, compound solubility in your essays because I I guess that uh, the solubility is very poor, no? Uh, especially if you are working with uh, non-polar compounds, they are not water soluble. So when you run the assay, you may have precipitates and they would interfere in what you get as a response. So to try to overcome this kind of problem, we, I think most people work on enzyme assay. I use uh, dimethyl sulfoxide as a co-solvent. It helps a lot and it helps you uh, solubilize compounds that are not water soluble. Uh, but you should be careful about the amount of the metal sulfoxide that uh, one enzyme can survive with the, 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 the solvent. And also to know if there is no, if, uh, the, there is no precipitation. Because sometimes you solubilize it in the metal sulfoxide. When you add water, you have to work with buffers. And so the compound is, doesn't remain soluble and then it would give you kind of uh, you know, a negative or positive, uh, especially negative uh, result and uh, that's not what really happens. But you know, I think all this kind of uh, um, assays used, they have some drawbacks. So this is one drawback for this enzyme I, uh, assays. Do we have any more questions? Oh, um, Lorenzo. Uh, professor, um, one qu uh, actually I have two questions. The first is, uh, did you try to see where these compounds been, bind in uh, catepsin K or catepsin B? Did you, if you know, uh, because I could not imagine that they're fixed so well in the active sites. And the other things is that did you ever try to see if you have synergies effect? Because at the end you get an extraction and it's like inhibit, but then you just see the inhibition effect of single compounds. Actually, for some of those, we really did the, the molecular modeling. They really don't bind in the active site. Uh, and for this kind of synergies effect, it's a, that, that's a, I think is the biggest problem to work with very complex mixture. You sometimes don't know if the activity you lose is due to synergistic effect or due to something else. I, know, I mean, for example, this compound, the, 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 this extract, they are very dirty. They are kind of uh, sometimes uh, scary. <laughs> but, uh, and then, you know, if you have a simpler mixture, it's always possible to see if there is any synergistic effect. But when you have this very complex mixture, I, I think it's a kind of, very stressing to try to get which mixture would give the best result. But it's quite common. You, you find a very strong inhibition for the crude extract. When you try to isolate the compound, then you lose uh, the activity somewhere. And you know, work with uh, undergrad and graduate students, this is not the kind of result they get, they like. So I just try to push and see what we can get best from that, but uh, that would be an interesting point. I mean, it's uh, because this is quite commonly happen uh, to lose the activity from fruit extract to pure compound. Thank you, Professor, for a nice presentation.
Uh, my question is actually the same that Lorenzo did about the, the bind mode of the, the, the ligands. And another question is in the same direction. When you propose the modification of the structure, you do base it... Uh, in based on chemistry and simple and easy chemistry. <laughs> That's all the, the main purpose. You know, when, because you see the, the molecules, they did some modification, they carried out some modification. They are very simple in terms of structure and in terms of fun functionalities. I mean, when you look at those compounds, you see where, where, where these compounds would bind. So we said, there is a hydroxyl here, there is a carboxyl there, so let's try to go into those directions. And that's what we did. So easy modification and, and uh, uh, mostly if we have, uh, first, first point is to have access to the compound. So most of the time you may have heard that uh, work with natural product kind of tough because you end up with few milligrams. And if, if you think in terms of structure modification, you should perform very easy modification. Otherwise you'll be in trouble. You will not have the starting material and uh, the, also the products if you uh, decide for a complicated uh, reaction. Thank you very much for our talk. And uh, I'm just curious about one thing that is, uh, when you do the extraction, you said that you go uh, selecting them by doing some experiments. And uh, what about when you come to the structures? Uh, do you also do some sort of triplication analysis, for instance, to identify the compounds are new, have already been tested against those targets? Or because you have had the bio-guided extraction, then you go for them? Well, this is a, a thing that I, I know. Each one has one uh, point of view on that, because uh, people usually say that it's uh, useless to re-isolate compounds that have been already isolated. On the other hand, some, if you have an, a non-compound, this new activity, it's interesting. So the, the best scenario is to have different compound, uh, new activity, new mode of action, and those kind of things. So that's what everybody looks for. But uh, it's not so easy to do that. Uh, what we usually do is that, we try to start with uh, plants that have never been studied before, is the first point. Second, we try to see before doing NSC, the kind of camps there is there. So we just run kind of a NMR data, but we don't really replicate, we don't know exactly what the compounds are there, uh, and do the assay. And uh, the way we try to simplify this, this uh, complex mixture, doing these procedures of isolation, like first, the, one of the most common is a liquid-liquid partition. So we start with a very complex mixture, like the methanol extract that has all kinds of compounds. And doing this liquid-liquid partition, have we kind of split the mixture in different polarities. So, and then we perform the assays again. So at this point, if you find good activity, we can have a guess of what kind of compound you're gonna get. So for example, we studied in this triterpene, they are quite simple for people having experience on NMR, you easily see which kind of compound you have. Just one quick question. What about water extracts? You've... Well, uh, this is another chance, but uh, what happens is uh, water extracts from plants, most of the time they have uh, quite a lot of phenolics and this phenol are not so welcome for enzyme assay. Even for developing any drugs, phenol are not so welcome because of this. People have saying that these are promiscuous. I mean, they can bind any place and they would not be uh, interesting for uh, development. But there are possibilities. Sure, there are. But the other point is that Work on these polar compounds, water-soluble compounds from plants and from other organisms is a kind of different way that we are used, used to, uh, to do, to, to work. So uh, this would uh, bring us uh, more difficulties in the isolation process and uh, 
all this kind of thing. But it, it's possible. Yes, the, 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 this is a possibility, of course. But I don't think people are uh, looking at that as a uh, with good expectation. Mostly, just forget about water uh, extract. Let's uh, thank Professor Vera again. A great talk. Thanks very much. Okay. I think it's time for some coffee.